Hi, everybody. Um, my name is John Byes. I want to talk about something called symmetric monoidal categories because they're a kind of Rosetta Stone connecting many different subjects. And this definitely won't be a math talk, so I, I will not define symmetric monoidal categories. There's some links embedded in the slides. Click on if you want to know the definition, and you can also just look it up on Wikipedia or something. Um, so instead of being formal about it, I'll just sort of vaguely uh, sketch the idea and then a lot of applications of that idea. Um, so there are lots of ways to get going on this, but what I'm especially interested in these days is how in many branches of science and engineering, people use diagrams with boxes connected by wires to describe what they're interested in. So like at upper left, you see an electrical circuit, an old style electrical circuit. Um, at upper right, that's actually a model of the HIV interacting with white blood cells and infecting white blood cells. This type of diagram is called a Petri net. And if you equip the processes like infection and so on with some rate constant saying how rapidly they proceed, you can turn such a picture into a set of differential equations that gives a model of such a process. And these processes are very widely used in chemistry, uh, but these models are very widely used in chemistry, but also as you can see here in, in, in biology and uh, population biology and epidemiology. Um, at lower left there, that's uh, somewhat cryptic to me, diagram from molecular biology. Uh, it's called the repressilator reaction. It doesn't really matter what it, it is, but it's, um, there are in fact so many different styles of diagram language in biology that there is actually a committee designed to uh, try to standardize these diagram languages. So they're beginning to think about them in a sort of more meta way. And at lower right, this is called a signal flow diagram. It's used in a subject called control theory where you have industrial processes very often with feedback loops involved, as you see here, uh, to make sure that things are running along on an even keel. So for example, if you're manufacturing some kind of chemical or something, you might use these diagrams. Um, and so what's interesting is that the people in all these different subjects think of these diagrams as the as the sort of personal property of their own subject. They think of mathematics as the mathematics that they learned in school. And so they will typically know how to convert their diagrams into mathematics that they learned in school, very often sets of differential equations, for example. Uh, but they find it more easy to reason about what's going on using these diagrams. But of course, as a mathematician, I can't help but notice that these diagrams are themselves perfectly legitimate mathematical objects. Um, and it happens all over the place. Particle physics is an area that's very close to mathematics in the sense that there are particle physicists talking to high powered mathematicians quite often. Uh, and in particle physics, uh, Richard Feynman invented these diagrams called Feynman diagrams now that describe processes involving elementary particles. So you could have a proton and an antiproton smack into each other, bust apart into some quarks, and then do some complicated reactions where other kinds of particles shoot out. And the reason why I mentioned this example is because in the 1990s, there was enough uh, talk between mathematicians and physicists that it became clear that mathematically, these Feynman diagrams are very interesting mathematical objects or strong morphisms, actually, mathematical things. Uh, and what they depict is morphisms in monoidal categories or actually symmetric monoidal categories sometimes. So in other words, there's a meeting between the physicists and the mathematicians where the mathematicians uh, being like Frenchmen, as Valeria said, said, oh, these are just morphisms in monoidal categories. And believe it or not, some of the physicists actually uh, went along with that <laughs> and started thinking that way.
So the point is that categories are a very general tool. They're great for all sorts of things, but one thing they're great for is describing processes of various sorts. So you can think of a process as having an input and an output. It may turn the input into the output or go from the input to the output in some manner. Uh, and so you can think of a morphism in a category as having an input and an output and being some kind of box with a wire coming in for the input and a wire coming out for the output. And these wires, uh, we call them the objects in our category. Um, and so the idea is that you can stick together uh, these kind of these very simple diagrams like the one I drew here to get more complicated ones, but only if the wires match. So you're only allowed to stick a wire of a certain kind into a certain uh, box. Just, just like when you're trying to assemble electronic hard hardware, you don't want to stick the wrong kind of uh, voltage line into your into your stereo or you'll blow a, blow a fuse or destroy your stereo. And so the idea is you, you can stick these things together if the output of F matches the input of G. So we call that composing morphisms. I'm sure you all know about that by now since this is the last day of the, of the talk series. Uh, so here what we're doing is composing morphisms F going from X to Y and G going from Y to Z and getting a new morphism called G composed with F going from X to Z. It might make more sense to call it F composed with a G because you're doing first F and then G, but this is the traditional ordering for, for it. Um, but what I wanted to get to was monoidal categories. And so the key to them is that in addition to doing processes one after another, you can do two side by side or in parallel. And we need a name for that thing. So uh, just based on some examples, it's called tensoring. Don't worry about really what, what that means. It, it's just an arbitrary term actually here. Uh, so, but we're tensoring a morphism F from X to Y and a morphism G from X prime to Y prime, and we're getting a morphism F tensor G going from X tensor X prime to Y tensor Y prime. So in a monoidal category, you have to have a way of sticking two objects side, and you have to have a way to stick two morphisms side by side, which we call tensoring. And there are different rules that should hold, of course, so I'm not going to list those all the axioms that need to hold for a category or a monoidal category. But one key feature is that all these rules look pretty obvious when you draw them using these diagrams that I'm drawing here. So for example, this scary looking equation on top of the slides, on top of the slide um, is just the equation way of saying the two ways of reading this diagram at the bottom of the slide actually agree. So in this picture at the bottom here, you can th the point is you can think of it two ways. So one way is this, we're composing F and G, and then we're composing F prime and G prime, and then we're tensoring the results. So that's the left side of the equation. But there's another way to think about what we're doing, which is that we're tensoring F and F prime, we're setting them side by side, and then separately we're tensoring G and G prime, and then we're composing the results, and that's the right-hand side. So this uh, rather intimidating looking equation on top is really just an equation saying that you can look at this picture here and it, and it describes a, a unique morphism, there's no ambiguity. So it's sort of like how, um, Sometimes in math, we need parentheses to disambiguate things, but then if certain laws hold, maybe you're allowed to leave out the parentheses. Like if you say five plus seven plus six, you don't need to stick in the parentheses there because there's a law that addition obeys that makes it unambiguous. Um, I wanna to get to symmetric monoidal categories. So a braided monoidal category is a step on route. And that's a monoidal category where you have these special morphisms called braidings, one for every pair of objects, X and Y, in your category, and they go from X tensor Y to Y tensor X. And you draw them just as switching two wires. So these are very natural things to think about because they're very often situations where we're trying to uh, switch things around in this way. Um, and these braidings are invertible, so they have a, another, there's another morphism going back, uh, the, sort of the reverse process, 
and we draw it as as below here. And so you can imagine that if we stuck the braiding and the braiding inverse together, you'd get a, a picture that were that looked like I'm just sort of uh, with my cursor indicating how you'd stick them together. You'd get something like that, and then you could pull it tight, pull it straight, and then the lines would be straight vertical, and that would be called an identity morphism. So, you're, so in other words, the inverse braiding just undoes the braiding. And so we're using these, we can draw diagrams where wires cross over each other, which is of course pretty important when you're drawing uh, diagrams of systems, you often have to have some crossings and some laws have to hold that again are obvious using pictures. Finally, a symmetric monoidal category is a special kind of braided monoidal category that obeys one extra law and that law says it doesn't matter which wire crosses over which, or which is over, which is under. So you see, if we have this law around, then uh, knots become easy to untie. If only all the wires on my desk here connecting my computer and my disk drive and everything obeyed this extra law, then I could just pass the wires uh, across each other in this knotted tangle of wires I could I could un unentangle. In, in three-dimensional space, this law is unrealistic and we need to be working with braided monoidal categories. Uh, but in the abstract mathematical world, when you switch two numbers, for example, you don't really talk about which number went over which other number. And so in three-dimensional, in, in, in abstract, uh, mathematical space, we often use symmetric monoidal categories and our, our math, our thoughts don't get to. Um, so there are tons of symmetric monoidal categories. There are just gazillions of them and gazillions of very interesting ones. So the most important one for traditional old math is the category of sets with the Cartesian product being the thing that I've been calling the tensor product in general. So this category, the objects are sets, the morphisms are functions, but the monoidal business is that given two sets, you can form a new set S times T, which is just the set of ordered pairs of elements one in S and one in T. So we use this all over the place, as you no doubt know. Um, people got more interested in the general concept of symmetric monoidal category when they started learning about a lot of different flavor examples one of them is the uh, category of Hilbert spaces and tensor product. So it's not at all necessary for you to know what those things are, but the point is that a Hilbert space is what you use to describe a quantum system, a physical system in quantum mechanics. And the morphisms between them, called linear operators, describe processes in quantum mechanics. And the tensor product of Hilbert spaces tells how you combine two quantum systems. That is, if I have an electron and another electron, each one will have its own Hilbert space. Well, let me say a better example for those of you who really know what's going on. I, I'd say if you have an electron and you have a proton, each one will have its own separate Hilbert space. And then you take the tensor product of those Hilbert spaces to get the uh, to describe the combined system, for example, if you're trying to describe a hydrogen atom that had an electron and a proton in it. And the interesting thing is that there are a lot of rules that we're used to with the symmetric monoidal category of sets and Cartesian product that don't hold for Hilbert spaces and their tensor product. And these dramatic differences go a long way to explaining why quantum mechanics seem weird. We say that the category of sets is a Cartesian symmetric monoidal category. And that allows for extra tricks, which you can't do in quantum mechanics. So for example, you may or may not have heard that in quantum mechanics, you can't clone a quantum state. If you have a electron in some particular state, there's no machine that you can drop it in, drop that electron into and have two electrons in an identical state pop out at the other end. Uh, whereas if I have a number, like I'm doing math, if I have a number, it's very easy to, for me to uh, put a number in and get an ordered pair of that number and the same number coming out. Um, so this is 
um, I think my preferred way of uh, understanding why quantum mechanics seems weird. Basically, we grew up in the world of thinking we were in the world of sets and Cartesian product. And then and it turns out that the physical universe is more like this other symmetric monoidal category. We sort of freak out because our familiar, uh, some of our rules don't apply anymore. Now, logic gives us lots of symmetric monoidal categories where the objects are statements, roughly speaking. I'm being pretty loose here. Uh, and morphisms are proofs. So a morphism from X to Y is a proof that the statement X implies the statement Y. And if you think about it, that's a pretty nice thing because if I have a proof that X implies Y and then called F and I've got a proof G that Y implies Z, clearly we can stick those together and get a proof that X implies Z. So we get this new proof that I could call G composed with F. And that makes us have a category. But also there's, well, there's actually a couple of ways we can make the category monoidal. One is we could make it use monoidal using and. So given two statements, X and X prime, in most forms of logic, you have a new statement called X and X prime. Um, but also, if I have a proof that X implies Y and a proof that X prime implies Y, I can combine those proofs to get a proof that X and X prime implies Y and Y prime. So, so logic is a fruitful source of symmetric monoidal categories, partially because there are many different forms of logic. There's good old classical logic, but there's intuitionistic logic, which Valerio was alluding to, and, and it turns out there's quantum logic and many other kinds of logic. Computer science gives us lots of symmetric monoidal categories too. A different metaphor is at work here. Here you can think of the objects as data types, types of data, not specific instances of a data type, but the type. Uh, and a morphism from one data type to another is a program that takes data of a given type as input and gives the other uh, data type as output. And clearly you should, in any respectable uh, programming language, be able to compose two programs so that if the output of the first is the input of the second, you can sort of stick them together and get a new program. And also you should be able to typically uh, tensor two programs, set them side by side, uh, because very often there is a concept of a product of data types. So for example, if you had one data type being like a list and another data type being a tree, then you could make a data type that consists of a list and a tree, a kind of ordered pair type construction. Uh, and so that also works uh, with programs that you can, if you have a program that turns something into something and the program that turns something else into something else, you can set them side by side and get a program that works for the product types. So that I should say that there's a thing called computational trinitarianism uh, there's a there's an attitude that some people have which that there are three ways of looking at the same thing and those three ways are category theory and uh, logic and computer programming and there's a correspondence between many ideas in, in any one of those subjects and corresponding ideas in the in the other two. <clears throat> and so part of what I'm doing here is I'm saying that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you've got symmetric monoidal categories uh, as a subject in itself, but then you get symmetric monoidal categories from logic and you get symmetric monoidal categories from uh, computer science or programming. And, and that, that there is computational uh, Trinitarianism in a nutshell. It becomes more interesting when you really work out all the details of how various ideas in one subject match up to ideas in the other. And then you can do all sorts of interesting tricks. But I don't want to stay just into in that realm of uh, of logic and, and computer science. Um, so when I got going on a certain project involving this stuff, uh, my my. My then grad student, Brendan Fong, I guess I'm pulling rank on him now, <laughs> but now, now the head of the uh, Topos Institute, and I started uh, studying symmetric monoidal categories where the morphisms are electrical circuits. So I, 
interested in these uh, different kind of diagram languages in engineering, and electrical circuits are an extremely studied uh, special case where mathematicians had already been thinking about them. But what we did is we figured out uh, that how quite precisely you could make a symmetric monoidal category where the morphisms are electrical circuits of some of some specific kind. So you could like make a category where all you get is resistors to play with, or another one where you get resistors and capacitors and, and so on. So there are many different categories that work there. And there are many other kinds of uh, networks that you could think of, but this example pushed us into developing a lot of abstract formalisms to be able to, to handle it well. Um, so the idea is then that there are categories of networks of many kinds. Here I'm drawing networks just in this very simple-minded way as, as directed graphs where you allow multiple edges between two vertices, but they're, it's just a sample of a type of network. The point is that you can compose two networks. If you think of a network as having some specified inputs and outputs, you can compose them by sticking the outputs of one to the inputs of the next. So here we're attaching this point Y to this point Y here and, and, and gluing these two networks together there, getting a bigger network. Uh, so, but then you can also tensor networks. So if I have this network F and this network G, I can just set them side by side, do them in parallel, so to speak, and get this, this new network. So there, there are many types of network examples of symmetric monoidal categories. And already with the electrical circuits, you can describe lots of other branches of engineering because there's a well-known set of analogies that elect electrical engineers and other engineers are fond of, which is an analogy, a quite precise analogy between uh, electronics, where you have concepts like current and voltage, and mechanics, where you have concepts like velocity and force, or maybe if you're studying rotations, angular velocity and torque, and so on. Hydraulics, thermodynamics, chemistry. The, the, there's, a, there's some big fat engineering books that try to describe the engineer's theory of everything, uh, which is to try to unify all these subjects. And so we can now go a little further on that using category theory. Uh, but there are other symmetric monoidal categories of networks, like in that first slide of mine, where you have these different kinds called open Petri nets or reaction networks or signal flow diagrams and so on. Uh, so we're trying to sort of get a high level mathematical perspective on all these diagram languages that, that different uh, kinds of scientists use. Um, so the idea is that in general, these, in these examples, the morphisms are describing open systems. And I think that's a really important concept an open system is a system that is able to interact with its environment. So typically stuff of some sort, any sort, matter, energy, information, whatever, can flow in or out of an open system. Um, and so the idea is to treat open systems as morphisms, and then that gives a formal way to describe our ability to build bigger open systems by sticking together smaller ones. And you see traditional physics would very often focus on closed systems, that is systems whose, whose behavior only depends on what's going on inside them, that, where you can ignore any interaction with the environment. But that's almost useless in engineering. In engineering, you need to interact with the system to, to be able to use it. So if an engineer sold you a black box that had you had no ability to do anything to it and it had no ability to do anything to you, well, that'd be useless, except maybe as a doorstop. Even as a doorstop, it would be interacting with the outside world, in fact. Uh, so we need to take concepts uh, that have been developed in physics, for example, and, and open them up, so to speak. And we're, we're doing that now using symmetric monoidal categories as a part of the, part of the uh, formalism. And so here's some kinds of lessons that you learn from this uh, attitude, from this shift to open systems. I mean, probably a bunch of you know all these things, but, but it's fun to notice that they're all examples of, the, of uh, switching to an open systems perspective. So one, for example, the development of life on Earth does not violate the second law of thermodynamics, as some uh, foolish people might think. Uh, because that law says that the entropy of any closed physical system must increase over time. 
Uh, but the Earth is not a closed system. Sunlight is what's powering the Earth. It's coming in from outside. So that's so thermodynamics uh, is currently being uh, not by us, but by lots of scientists being generalized from closed systems to open systems, and then the, the rules of the game change a little bit. Um, another one is people like to worry about quantum mechanics, and there's this thing called the collapse of the wave function, where you measure something and it suddenly seems to have a more definite state, and it seems to go against the normal rules for how things change in quantum mechanics, the so-called unitary time evolution. Well, in fact, uh, it, it doesn't violate the, those rules. The point is that unitary time evolution is the way a system must evolve if it's a closed system, but we need to generalize that to open systems to understand measurement processes. Whenever you have a measurement process, what you have is some open system, which is the system being measured, and it's interacting with some other open system, which is the, the thing that's doing the measuring. And so we need to think about things in that perspective to understand what the heck is going on with these quantum puzzles. Um, another example is that a cell phone, for example, is not a Turing machine. I've gotten into some arguments with some uh, people who love uh, the church Turing uh, hypothesis or thesis, I guess it's called, that, that says that you know a huge variety of, of systems can be thought of as uh, can be mapped onto Turing machines. And I like to irritate them by saying, no, not even a cell phone can, can you think of it as a Turing machine. And they get ups, upset by that. And then I say, well, the point is that in a Turing machine, you set up the Turing machine initially, uh, and, then it, and then it just runs from there. So it has one input, basically, your initial state of your tape, and then one output, your final state of the tape, if it halts. Uh, but a cell phone is constantly with its environment. So there's constant input and output of information. And also at, at times that are unpredictable to the cell phone itself. You may suddenly, I may suddenly get a call right now from, my, from someone else, for example. Uh, so the point is that a, a classic Turing machine, of course there are different generalizations, is, is a closed system, but uh, realistic uh, computers like cell phones are open systems and we need to think about them that way to understand what, the, what they really are. And my favorite example are ecosystems of various sorts, but really any sort of agent or intelligence or organism or ecosystem or manufacturing process is an open system. And you have to think of it as an open system to really understand it. Because if you, if you try to close, close it off, then, it, the whole the whole point of it is lost. Um, so here's an ecosystem, and we see the the wind and the sun are powering it, and it, there's various outputs. But also, for example, if you have some intelligent agent, if it needs to interact with its environment to even count as being intelligent. So we need abstractions that can handle this, and symmetric monoidal categories are are part of the uh, part of what we need to do that. Just a small part, but I think a very essential part.